Okay, bonbonim. My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the most handsome professor of psychology on earth, after Jordan Peterson, of course. And today we are going to discuss the following. You are the narcissist Netflix. He pays a subscription, he controls you with a remote control, and he expects you to be available on demand. One could say that you are a pod, partner on demand. You're the narcissist, pod. And the questions we're going to deal with today are two. Question number one, why are you staying? Why do you remain in the relationship? Why don't you bail out? Why don't you break up? Why don't you just vanish? Why don't you discard him rather than the other way around? And the second question is, why do you cheat on each other? The narcissist cheats on you, and more frequently than you care to admit, you cheat on him. Why is all this happening? And we're going to come up with some very, very surprising answers based on the latest studies and, and research and so on and so forth, as is our habit. We're going to discover that people stay in relationships, women more specifically, stay in relationships for very surprising reasons. And we're going to find out that narcissists cheat for reasons which have nothing to do with the reasons healthy people cheat. Narcissists have very special reasons to cheat. And as usual, these reasons are surrealistic, alien, out of this world and out of your mind. So let us plunge in, shall we? Why why do some spouses elect to, to have extramarital affairs, to deceive their partners, or otherwise just to remain in a marriage or in a relationship which is devoid of love, devoid of intimacy, and very often, more often than not, devoid of sex, definitely devoid of good sex? Why stay in such a relationship? Why would any person in his or her right mind make such a self-defeating and demoralizing choice why not abandon ship altogether why eat keep eating the stale and putrid cake and still have it why sacrifice your morality your values everything just in order to stay stuck in something which is dragging you down day by day, driving you to literal ins insanity and to dysfunction. We have discovered a few very surprising things about the inertia of relationships, why people don't bail out. And one of the most famous discoveries was hidden or sunk costs. Sunk costs is when you throw good money after bad money. You had already invested 20 years in the relationship. Bailing out sounds like a bad investment strategy. On the contrary, you should redouble your efforts. You should try to restore and fix your marriage. Um, after all, you had put in so much. Your effort, the best years of your life. You have common memories. You have common children. There's a lot going on. And so we have this tendency in human affairs, not only in relationships, to redouble our efforts and our investment, even and especially when they go wrong and awry. And this is called the sunk cost fallacy. The rational thing to do, of course, is if you made the wrong choice, if you adopted the wrong decision, if you had embarked on the wrong course of action, never mind how much you had invested, you should just put an end to it. You should just stop everything and get out. But few people do this. So this was one of the most famous discoveries, the sunk cost fallacy. But we have discovered some additional things. Here are the reasons, here are the most commonly given reasons in studies and research for why people stay. Number one, and it will come as no surprise to the vast majority of you, money. The most recurring and the most crucial reason is guilt, money, and what money affords, the freedom and the security 
that money provides. Financial security and prosperity trump all other considerations, it seems. Everyone at heart is a gold digger. Driven by fear, driven by insecurities, by low self-esteem, by sheer avarice, greed, people sacrifice everything. They sacrifice their individuality, their identity, their morality, their values. They even sacrifice their children's mental or physical health. They sacrifice their own physical and mental health. They sacrifice the ultimate thing. They sacrifice their happiness, their well-being, their inner peace, everything, just to wake up in the morning knowing that you have a roof over your head and food on the table. Financial security, economic considerations are by far the main reason people stay in highly dysfunctional, problematic, dying, dead relationships. These are empty shells supported by the golden calf. And so many people have lack self-confidence they don't have any marketable skills. They have very rudimentary or basic education, high school or less. They are old, too old to enter the, the workplace, the, the market. Uh, or they simply have a wrong self-perception, an erroneous self-perception. Very, very low self-esteem and self-confidence can lead to the conclusion that you will never amount to anything that you will never be good at anything, that you, know how, you don't know how to make money, that you can't survive on your own. And so this is a self-hostaging situation. You, you're taking yourself hostage. You're putting yourself in a Stockholm syndrome. You're inserting yourself into a Stockholm syndrome founded on the assumption that whatever you have within the marriage, whatever, whatever had survived, within this emptiness and desert of a meaningful relationship, whatever the crumbs, the residues, the vestiges, the ruins, archaeological ruins of what used to be, even this is better than any alternative you can come up with or conjure. And then you stay. You stay because you're afraid. You're terrified of going out there, venturing out there on your own. And the narcissist invests years and decades in convincing you that you're right. You, will, you are no good. You will amount to nothing. You will succeed in nothing. You will not be able to make a living. You will not be able to survive on your own. And you buy into this crucial pillar of the shared fantasy. I'm the provider, says the narcissist, and without me, you will be destitute and desolate and poor and probably homeless. The second reason, surprising reason, people give women, um, the emphasis is on women in this case, because women initiate 73% of all divorces. Women break up couples. Women break up marriages. Men are very content. Men are very happy in marriage because men are served, um, they, are, they prosper within marriages. It is the woman usually who suffers and consequently it is the woman who initiates divorce in the vast majority of cases. So one, one of the reasons women stay, remain in dark, hopeless uh, relationships which lead nowhere, dead end, cul-de-sac relationships, one of the reasons they say stay in such relationships is because they pity. They pity their partner. They are compassionate. They care for the partner. They keep catastrophizing. These women catastrophize. They, they keep imagining that the partner cannot survive without them. That if they were to leave the partner, he will die of a heart attack or something, stroke, I don't know what. That he is as helpless as a child without them. That he needs them. Crucially, that in their absence, he is bound to make wrong decisions, deteriorate, degenerate, decompose, and just kill himself one way or another. And they're terrified. They don't want this to happen to him. 
they still, in some way, even if they don't love the partner anymore, they deeply care about the partner. The remaining intimacy is sufficient to motivate him to to motivate the 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 woman to be compassionate and caring and affectionate. And so pity, pity, pity is a huge element in in going on, in keeping on, keeping on. This is especially common in couples where one of the partners is parentified, where one of the partners plays the role of a parent. You're his mother, he's your father. Divorce then feels like abandoning a helpless, hurting child. And what mother can abandon her child, really? So this is the second most important reason. The third most important reason, and you've noticed, you've noticed by now that I didn't mention children, will come to children at the very end. Children are actually not as important a reason as people think. Okay, the next important reason is shared memories and common history. The attachment and the bonding are displaced into a counterfactual, a fantastic, a sentimental memory landscape, memory scape of nostalgia. The couple becomes sticky and the glue that holds the couple together, despite all the pain, despite all the hurt, despite, despite all the betrayals, in the face of the hollowing out of the relationship, the glue that still holds everything together is memory and common history and nostalgia and the pain of letting go of, of a part of yourself when you, when you let go of him. There is an element of fusion, an element of merger. You consider him a critical vector and dimension of your identity. And without him, you are less you. You are no longer you without him. And of course, you have a shared, shared memory pool, common experiences, common adventures, funny things that had happened, horrible things that you had survived together. And these things bind you. These things hold you together. Because these things are your personal history. They are who you are. And without him, you are no more. Now we come to children. When the couple has common children, the children's interest and welfare actually come um, at a very low, as a very low priority. The children's interest and welfare, these are really a truly, truly decisive parts of the calculus of pros and cons. Parents lie to themselves, they deceive themselves into believing that their kids, the kids are the reason they are not divorcing. The reason they are not breaking up is to maintain the peace of mind or the inner peace or the psychological welfare, uh, the proper developmental path of their children or to send them to college together, pooling up economic resources. At any rate, when you ask, when you ask men and women, why do you stay in this clearly defunct liaison, in this non-functioning diet? They would often tell you because of the kids. Once the kids leave home, there's an empty nest, we are likely to break up. But this is an excuse, of course. It's an excuse. Parents deceive themselves into believing this because it's socially acceptable and it's egocentric. Many of these reasons are actually um, forms of grandiosity. When you say he cannot survive without me, I pity him, he's like my child, I cannot abandon him. That's grandiose, of course. It's grandiosity. He will survive without you. He had survived without you before he had met you. And he will survive without you long after you're gone. But you can't admit it. It's too painful. And it negates your core grandiosity. And so this is a grandiose excuse to remain in the relationship. Similarly, to say, to claim that you are in the relationship because of your children's well-being and welfare, welfare and interests, that's also a grandiose statement. It's actually a self-sacrificial statement. 
look what a moral person I am. Look what a good person I am. Look what a wonderful person I am. Look what a wonderful mother I am. I'm sacrificing my own, my own well-being. I'm sacrificing my own mental and physical health just to sustain and maintain the physical and mental health of my children. Never mind that this flies in the face of anything and everything we know about the mental health of children in dysfunctional, in dysfunctional marriages. It's much better if you really, if your child's well-being, um, welfare and interests are, are in your mind, I mean, if, you, if you're mindful to them, you would divorce. If your relationship is cantankerous, acrimonious, if you keep fighting, if there's no agreement, if there's no cooperation, if you hate each other, if you betray each other, if you cheat on each other, the, one who, the, the ones who pay the price are your children. Your children's physical and mental health is adversely affected within a dysfunctional marriage much more than it, they would be outside such a marriage. You want to take care of your children? You love your children? You want them to be happy and healthy? You divorce. You divorce. You don't stay in a marriage that's not working for you and, of course, for your partner. Because if it's not working for you, <clears throat> it's not working for your partner, it's most definitely is not working for your children. The next reason is cultural and social mores. In some societies, in some cultures, divorce is still frowned upon. It is stigmatized. It's shameful and disgraceful to divorce. In some societies and cultures, divorce carries, an in, it carries inordinate costs. For example, in many societies, the woman loses access to the children. Custody is granted to the men in some societies, mainly Muslim societies. And share, the woman can lose her share in the community property in other countries. At any rate, divorced people are much more likely to sink under the poverty line. And they find it more difficult to to find gainful employment, which accords with their qualifications and skills, which is commensurate with their education and so on. Divorce is a harrowing, traumatic event, also economically, but it has other attendant costs, social costs, cultural costs, and legal costs, which render the whole process very, very fraught and difficult and potentially dangerous. So people say, better stay in the relationship than go through this. This is especially true if you're divorcing someone who is a narcissist or a psychopath or paranoid or a stalker or, or a vindictive type of person or just an abuser or a vengeful type of person. I mean, these kind of people drag out the divorce, render it into a traumatic, acrimonious uh, process which can never be forgotten. They, they convert the the breakup or they convert the divorce into a nightmare and they pursue this nightmare with relish they invest in it it is a work of art it involves bullying it involves stalking it involves threats it involves withholding it involves denial of access it involves uh, underhanded tactics and techniques criminal acts even so some people people who are married to narcissists and psychopaths they say well <laughs> better freeze where i am it's a freeze, it's a freeze response, you know, flight or fight, it's a, it's a flight or fight or freeze, it's a, this is the freeze part. So many people are trapped in relationships, especially with narcissists and psychopaths and paranoids, not necessarily because they are afraid for their lives or something, although this also, this also happens, but because they know that what could have been an amicable an amicable splitting of assets and, and liabilities and obligations and rights, and, you know, what could have been a, um, a very friendly parting of ways uh, is bound to become uh, an infernal, an infernal process which will consume them and, and leave nothing out. I mean, destroy. It's all pervasive. It's a process which will destroy every aspect of their lives. And people don't want that simply. Okay, so people stay in relationships. 
for the reasons that I've enumerated. But why, why do they cheat on each other? So healthy people, normal people, basically cheat for two reasons. Either they have unmet needs, they have sexual needs, they have emotional needs, they have basic needs for intimacy, compassion, a hug, a cuddle. They need to be seen, they need to be attended to, they need attention, they need to, they need a friend. And all this is missing in the relationship, so they cheat. They cheat in the sense that they find, find an alternative. They outsource their needs. Now, the majority of women cheat for this reason. A small minority of women and a majority of men cheat because they want to experience other bodies, other sex acts, for diversity, for variety, because it's fun, because it's on the menu, and they want, don't want to eat the same dish every, every night. So, um, variety, diversity, thrill, thrill-seeking, novelty-seeking, risk-taking, the, fr the forbidden fruit, all these play an element in the minority of women who cheat and majority of men who cheat. Men are opportunistic. They react to availability, essentially. If a woman is available, they're very likely to cheat. Women are much more, uh, much more programmatic. They are much more, they, they, they plan ahead. Um, when a woman cheats or betrays, it's rarely, very rarely, um, casual sex or a one night stand. In most cases, actually, she's looking for a long term lover to kind of complement what she misses at home. So this is why, why healthy people cheat. But narcissists and psychopaths and borderlines and histrionics and paranoids, and schizoids, people with personality disorders, they cheat on their spouses, they commit adultery and they have extramarital affairs or liaisons. And they even have casual sex for reasons which reflect internal psychodynamic processes. In other words, where healthy people typically commit adultery or infidelity when they react to an adverse environment. Healthy people commit, healthy people cheat because the environment they are in is unhappy, unsatisfactory problematic. So healthy people cheat in reaction to the environment. Their cheating is reactive in most cases. Narcissists and people with cluster B and other personality disorders, they cheat in reaction to internal processes. Their cheating is also reactive, but it's not reactive to the environment. Put differently, you could be the best spouse in the world, the most loving, the most empathic, the most caring, the most compassionate, the most everything, the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most everything. You could be the ideal. You could be the queen bee. And yet, the narcissist will cheat on you. He will cheat on you because it has nothing to do with you. It's not... Cheating, in the case of the narcissist, is not Q-activated. Is not the outcome of signaling from the environment. Is not an attempt to extricate himself from a situation or from circumstances or from an environment which he dislikes or which doesn't cater to his needs. No, the narcissist cheats because something happens inside him of which he is usually not fully aware. And these processes are seething. They, they are, they're fermenting. They are, they kind of, it's like lava. It's like magma in a volcano. It's like it's like an earthquake tremor or tremblor. It's like a, a an oncoming tsunami wave. And everything there inside the narcissist is shaking and breaking and unsettling and unbalancing and destabilizing. And then finally, there is this discharge, which we call in clinical terms, acting out. Finally, there's a discharge of this energy. And the discharge is, in many cases, via cheating, through cheating. So the narcissist releases. It's an act of release. It's not an act towards something. It's an act away from something. While healthy people cheat because they, they, they try to obtain some goal, it's, their cheating is towards something. 
is towards someone, is towards love, is towards excitement, is towards compassion. Healthy, healthy people cheat because they seek in the outside what they miss at home. And so it is goal oriented, it's other oriented, it's a form of object, object relations, external object relations. Narcissists don't cheat um, directionally, they don't cheat at someone, but at something, but they cheat internally. They cheat in order to regulate their internal environment. We could therefore say that cheating is a form of re-regulation, form of internal regulation, or because emotions are dysregulated, for example, example in borderline, negative emotions are dysregulated with the narcissist and psychopath. Um, moods are labile in all these disorders. Impulses are uncontrolled. So the narcissist uses cheating to get a hold of himself, to control his internal environment, to re-establish a modicum of order and structure where chaos threatens to prevail. And so here are the reasons why narcissists cheat. First of all, and the most important reason, is they seek narcissistic supply. This is especially the case with the somatic narcissist. Somatic narcissist needs a serial sexual conquest to regulate his internal environment, his sense of self-worth, his self-esteem. So the quest for narcissistic supply. Number two, frustration and boredom. Psychopaths, to a large degree, narcissists, borderlines and so on, they have a low boredom threshold. They get bored very easily and they cannot tolerate boredom. Boredom creates anxiety and they are bored and they're also frustrated very often because of unrealistic expectations or because of, of mismatch between reality and grandiosity or because of uncontrollable impulses. But this confluence of boredom and frustration causes them to decompensate and act out. They have this low tolerance thresholds for, for frustration and boredom push them inexorably to reduce the frustration re and eliminate the boredom and thereby mitigate and ameliorate the resulting anxiety. Sexual dalliances, sexual affairs, short or long, one night stands or two year, two year love affair, alleviate this nagging and frustrating and weak. The quest for novelty, diversions, thrills, a vacation from, from one's own life in a way. This is combined with the journey of self-exploration and discovery that involves filling in the gaps in the narcissist's biography. The narcissist, for example, the narcissist's childhood was very problematic, very traumatic, very abusive. The narcissist never becomes a normal adolescent, actually never becomes an adolescent, period. So the narcissist uses cheating as a way of um, re-experiencing, reviving his missed adolescence. So he, narcissists are very likely to look up old flames or to try to emphasize a new aspect of the personality within the, the uh, transgression, within the, the act of cheating. Number three is that the narcissist um, as I've said before in, in several videos, narcissists maintain an island, a focus of stability. In the narcissist's life, there is this oasis of stability, this point and counterpoint of stability. But all the other dimensions of the narcissist's existence and life are chaotic, unstable, unpredictable. It's like this huge, perfect storm swirling around this placid and beautiful island. And so this twister formation serves many emotional needs, which I had discussed elsewhere. So the narcissist, for example, can be a model, model employee. He can have a career which he pursues over decades, but then he would need to cheat on his wife. He would need to fritter their savings away. He would need to gamble compulsively. He would need to drive recklessly. He would need to do drugs. In other words, if there is an island of stability, he needs, the narcissist needs to compensate with instability in all other dimensions of his life. So if this, the island of stability is the workplace, 
the career, the intellect, the narcissist would try to introduce instability, chaos, disorder into the remaining dimensions of his existence, including his marriage. If he is a great employee, if he's a chief executive officer of a company, if he is stable in his profession, if he is, then he would need to cheat on his wife because this stability must always be compensated for with instability. It's a, it's a law. It's a law of nature almost. Con conversely, if the narcissist is, has an unstable career, if, he's, if he changes jobs very often, if he has no skills, if he's itinerant, if he, if he never survives in any workplace for more than three months, he is extremely unlikely to cheat on his wife because he has the instability that he needs elsewhere in the workplace. So he does not need to inject instability into his marriage. His marriage is the island of stability. His marriage is the anchor and the axis and the pivot, and he will not risk it. It will remain stable and he will never cheat. The next reason is that narcissists feel superior and important, and so they feel entitled to be above the law. They feel they have every right to engage in behaviors that are socially unacceptable, that are frowned upon, and that are considered um, condemnable. Um, the narcissists always pretend to, to, to be moral people. They always claim they're good people, they're moral people. So they are likely to condemn cheating and condemn infidelity and adultery, especially if they are also ostensibly religious people. So they will be the first to cast the stone. They will be the first to chastise and castigate and criticize and, you know, someone who had cheated on his wife, for example. But secretly, they will engage in the same behavior. They re narcissists reject and vehemently resent all limitations and conditions placed upon them by their partners. We'll discuss this in a minute. Narcissists act on their impulses and desires, unencumbered by social conventions and strictures. They are above the law. The next reason is that marriages, monogamy, and childbearing and child rearing, these are common activities. Average people do these things. Common people do these things. When the narcissist engages in a typical marriage with a typical brood of children, in a typical suburb, the narcissist feels robbed of his uniqueness. This lifestyle, these pursuits uh, denigrate him. He feels humiliated having ended up this way because everyone and his dog has a family. Everyone has a wife. Everyone has a house in the suburbs. The narcissist is not everyone. He's unique. He's special. He's unprecedented. He's cosmically significant. What on earth is he doing with a wife and three children and one and a half dogs mowing the lawn? Something's wrong here. He feels that he had been coerced into the relationship, into these roles, roles, roles of a husband, roles of a father. He, he doesn't like that. He feels that it reduce, these roles reduce him to the lowest common the lowest of common denominators. And this is narcissistic injury. And it leads him to rebel, to reassert his superiority and specialness by maintaining extramarital affairs. So cheating in this case is an act of defiance. It's what we call in, in psychology a reactant act. It's an act of reactance. It's an act intended to signal I am not bound by any rules, by any laws, and by any rules, and by any regulations. I'm not common. I am not like you. I am special. I'm doing things, special things. I'm cheating. I'm extricating myself. I'm taking myself out of this world that you had created for me, that you had tricked me into, that you had coerced me into. I, I resent this. Narcissists are control freaks, and having a relationship implies give and take. Uh, it's a train of compromises, which a narcissist acutely interprets as a loss of control over his life. If you have to give and take, you're not in control, you're not omnipotent, you're not godlike. 
and to reassert this omnipotence, this grandiosity, this control, this div these divine attributes, the narcissist initiates other relationships in which he is the one who is dictating the terms of engagement. Narcissists are terrified of intimacy. Their behavior is a kind of approach, avoidance, repetition, compulsion. Adultery is a formidable and excellent tool in the armory, in the arsenal of retarding intimacy. Adulter nothing like adultery and infidelity and cheating to destroy intimacy. And once in intimacy is gone, what remains is a less threatening mode of interaction. Narcissists actually like relationships where the intimacy is demolished and nothing is eradicated and nothing is left of it. Because intimacy is suffocating and stifling and imprisoning. In intimacy is, is shackles. Intimacy is the opposite of freedom. Narcissists typically claim that they have cheated in order to put the spark back into the relationship with the spouse or primary intimate partner. Of course, how exactly an act of betrayal and faithlessness can rekindle the embers of a relationship founded initially on trust and sexual and emotional exclusivity, how this miracle is accomplished is left conveniently unspecified. In the wake of an affair, the narcissist possesses the perfect alibi. If he does try to revive his sex life with his spouse and fails, he can proudly say, I left no stone unturned. I even went as far as cheating on my partner, all in order to resurrect our bond. If he doesn't try to reanimate his sex life with his spouse, he turns it around and says, this is proof that the relationship was doomed to start with, and what I did, therefore, was not cheating. It was actually forced, I was actually forced to seek sexual and emotional alternatives by the dead weight of this relationship. And so this is the narcissist's um, way of, of looking at, of, of regarding, let's say, um, cheating. But there are gradations of, of cheating. And when I say narcissist, I want you to be clear. Many, many victims of narcissistic abuse um, identify the narcissism of their partner, but they fail to identify their own narcissism and their own contribution. The more you spend time with the narcissist, the more narcissistic and psychopathic you are. And some, some of the victims started off as narcissists. They teamed up with the narcissist because they were, for example, covert narcissists or inverted narcissists. So there's a lot of narcissism to go around. It's not limited to one of our partners. And when I talk about cheating, I'm referring to both parties because the most typical case is actually when both partners cheat on each other, successively or simultaneously. Much more common is triangulation. There are two types of triangulation. Triangulation, to remind you, is using a third party to manage the emotional, intimacy, and transactional aspects of a relationship. And no, I, I've heard a, a wannabe coach, a wannabe narcissism expert stating that triangulation is secret. That's just about the most stupid statement I've ever heard. Triangulation cannot be secret. The aim of triangulation is to get a rise out of the partner. Triangulation is always ostentatious and conspicuous and evident. In public. Tri to triangulate means to use another party, to use a third party, to provoke your partner, to make him do something or prevent him from doing something or get an emotional rise out of him. So how can it be secret? <sighs> These coaches and experts will be the death of me. Okay, Th so there are two types of triangulation. Breakup triangulation involves overt an ostentatious cheating with a third party in conjunction with other egregious misbehavior. The aim of breakup triangulation is to irrevocably break up with an existing partner. Why triangulate? Why not simply terminate? There are many reasons, some of them I've mentioned before. Revenge, rage, community property, inability to let go, 
among codependents, for example, in borderlines, restoring the cheater's self-esteem within the relationship, feeling desirable and alive again, obtaining succor and ersatz, faith and intimacy, or uncertainty about one's true wishes. You cheat because it's not clear to you what, what you really want to do, how you want to proceed, whether you want the, the relationship to survive or not. But usually it is simply the desire to cast your mate, your partner, as the villain. The villain who ended it all because he is insanely jealous and not magnanimous or empathic enough to forgive you and to understand your transgressions. So this is breakup triangulation. Restorative triangulation, triangulation that is intended to restore, has the exact opposite goal, to revive the relationship by provoking an emotional response from the jilted partner. Such triangulation involves the mere favorable mention of another person, hints at possible misconduct or compromising circumstances, or, at a maximum, aggressive flirting and non-penetrative sex acts, such as kissing or petting, making out, hugging, you know, this kind of thing. Triangulation, everyone knows, is a last resort, and it's a risky strategy. It often escalates counterproductively into sexual assault by the, by the recruited third party. It also results in an extreme reaction by the offended partner, who chooses to discard sometimes an unfaithful, flirtatious, disrespectful, seductive, narcissistic, histrionic, and disempathic counterparty. So it's a Russian roulette. You are you are gambling with everything when you triangulate. Um, many partners perceive triangulation as the exact equivalent of cheating, as a form of cheating. Triangulation, using a third party to provoke jealousy to, to, in your partner, to garner attention from your partner, to punish your intimate partner, triangulation sometimes goes awry, ends badly. The third party can sexually assault you assault you or your your targeted intimate partner can simply walk away from the whole manipulative scene most triangulators are impulsive and defiant and these are psychopathic traits most triangulators externalize their own aggression and dysregulated negative emotions which often overwhelm them the thinking of triangulators is short term their empathy is gone and they're often shocked by the consequences of their own misbehavior. Being raped by the nice guy, or a breakup with a spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend. Things especially cascade and escalate out of control. If all the parties involved are immature and narcissistic, if all of them are callous and exploitative and aggressive or even violent, what starts as a mere flirt, flirtation, ends up being a deleterious power play to the point of no return for everyone involved. Beware. When it comes to sexual assault also, there are no safe men or safe women, more rarely. So, these are, these are the rudiments of, of cheating and, and, and triangulation. And one very important element in all this, as you have noticed, is defiance. And we defy usually two classes of things. We defy overt expressed demands and also implicit demands. We, we defy demands. And we defy expectations. Now very often innocent innocuous speech acts are interpreted as demands. Even a request can be perceived or misperceived as demand. Even a wish, even a dream, even a fantasy, even not saying anything and not moving can be interpreted or misinterpreted as the de a demand. And this is called referential ideation. This is one form of refer ideas of reference. Similarly, expectations. Expectations are usually in the air. They're ambient. Regrettably, very few people communicate expectations clearly, unequivocally, 
unambiguously and explicitly. So they are in the air. And everyone has to guess and use telepathy to gauge the expectations of the partner. And this leads to numerous misunderstandings and problems. Now, narcissists, psychopaths, borderlines, paranoids, histrionics, etc., react very badly to demands real or misperceived, true or imaginary. And they react even worse to expectations because they perceive ex expectations as a form of criticism. And so expectations cause immediately narcissistic injury. While demands threaten and challenge freedoms, expectations threaten and challenge one, the narcissist's sense of self-worth, his grandiosity. So, many years ago, uh, a UK child psychologist by the name of Elizabeth Ann Newson came up with, with an idea. She, she, she was working with autistic children. And she came up with a psychological construct, which she, she named pathological demand avoidance. She thought at the time that pathological demand avoidance is a subtype of autism spectrum disorder. Pathological demand avoidance is when someone refuses to do what is expected of him, what is asked of him. He even refuses to do what is expected of him and what is required of him, even if he likes it. So he refuses the the core, the core act, the core uh, behavior. The core effect is refusal. Like if it is a demand, if it is an expectation, even if I would like actually the outcome, I'm going to refu refuse and decline it. It's a form of defiance. And at the beginning, people said, well, it's like oppositional defined disorder. These are simply defined kids. But that's not entirely true because people with pathological demand avoidance are passive aggressive. They're avoidant. They are, they are they're manipulative. While people with oppositional defined disorder are extreme, violent, aggressive, embarrassing, age inappropriate, etc. So oppositional defined disorder is in your face. Pathological demand avoidance is covert. It's passive aggressive. It's under the radar. It's manipulative. It's subterranean. It's subtle. And it's very difficult to spot, to describe and to capture and to prove. So pathological demand avoidance, in my opinion, is not only typical of people with autism spectrum disorder. I think most narcissists actually engage in pathological demand avoidance. It's an integral part of the bargaining phase in the shared fantasy. You remember in the shared fantasy, when you start to make demands, when you start to develop expectations, when you try to negotiate and haggle and reach compromises at that point, which, which is the bargaining phase, the narcissist begins to push you away. He begins to, he, he begins to, he becomes absent. He withdraws, he becomes avoidant, he becomes cold, he becomes disinterested, and he pushes you actively away from him, sometimes away to other men. He pushes you to cheat, which is uh, what the topic of my previous video about collusive infidelity. So we're beginning to see how everything meshes in. Pathological demand avoidance in the bargaining leads to collusive infidelity as a way to get rid of you, in effect. And so, uh, a debate started, and regrettably, the whole thing died out, petered out. I think it's a mistake because Newson was onto something. Uh, there were other scholars which said that um, there's a lot in common between PDA, pathological demand avoidance, and some behaviors in psychopaths. At any rate, uh, in 2014, someone put up a list of proposed criteria for pathological demand avoidance. And I'll read the list to you. Number one, passive early history, passive early history in the first year, avoiding ordinary demands and missing milestones. Number two, continuing to avoid demands, panic attacks, 
attacks if demands are escalated. Number three, surface sociability, but apparent lack of sense of social identity. Number four, lability of mood and impulsivity. Number five, comfortable in role play and pretending. Number six, language delay, seemingly the result of passivity, often caught up quickly later on. Number seven, obsessive behavior. Number eight, neurological signs like awkwardness, similar to autism spectrum disorder. Pathological demand avoidance can be de definitely conceptualized as an anxiety disorder. It's a kind of anxiety reaction where the cause of the anxiety is real or anticipated demands, actual, factual, or perceived expectations. This creates anxiety. Anxiety creates aggression. And I, I recommend that you watch my videos on the nexus between narcissism and autism, because I explained there that the autistic child is so different, so unique in, in the bad sense, actually, in the beginning, so shunned, excommunicated by his peers, even by his own parents, that many, many autistic children develop pronounced narcissistic defenses. And I think demand avoidance, this extreme reaction, radical reaction to being imposed upon, which is essentially a schizoid feature. You see how everything comes together. The schizoid element, the psychopathic element, the narcissistic element, grandiosity, the autistic element. So this is all interconnected. And now back to cheating. Very often the narcissist will cheat because of pathological demand avoidance. He perceives that the, the more you escalate your demands, the more he thinks that he is letting, letting you down, not meeting your expectations, the more he can try to exit this framework, this relationship with you, because it causes him constant narcissistic injury and he's terrified of ultimate mortification. He also anticipates your own betrayal. He, he anticipates that you will cheat on him, that you will betray him. So he has numerous very good reasons to break up with you. This is the sequence. The sequence is that the narcissist is a schizoid. He wants to be left alone to play. He wants you to be there on demand, like Netflix. He wants to control you with a remote control as he does with Netflix and his television. And if you suddenly come alive, if you're independent and autonomous, if you require and demand things, if you express your wishes and dreams and expectations, you're bad for him. You threaten him. You destabilize him. He needs to get away from you because he knows that he's going to let you down. He knows that you're going to get more and more angry, more and more disappointed, up to, up to the point that you will hurt him badly up to the point of mortification, which is, mortification is the thing the narcissist wants to avoid the most in the world. And it's leading there. So he cheats first. Preemptive abandonment. No one said narcissism is simple or easy. 